I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my life living in Nicaragua. Today, we're going to talk about something that you need as a skill when moving abroad. Typically, if you're moving away from North America, which the majority of the people on my channel who are uh, in that relocation category tend to be coming from North America more than anywhere else. And if you're coming from there, you have a certain context that is relatively unique in the world, and partially because these are just very large countries in a very large region that is mostly self-contained, surrounded by oceans in nearly all cases. This makes for a unique geographic experience and one that can be very confusing when you go farther afield and explore more of the world. So we're going to talk about the need to think in a global context and how that's going to change everything about how you think about living in most new countries. Right after the Thanks for coming back, everybody. So today we're here in the studio and I'm doing a little bit different because I'm playing with some different lighting things. I'm playing with a different setup because the new studio was built today by Chepe. I'm gonna show it. I've showed it a little bit on the shorts, but I'm gonna show it more uh, in upcoming videos, but I'm just very excited to be able to be, use it, but I've also been stuck indoors because of just being very busy and because of the work being done. Uh, but later this week, I'm gonna be in the field doing an interview in Managua, hopefully getting some additional footage while out in Managua. So I'm gonna get some, but Today, we're still stuck in the studio, but I have lots of new cool studio space and a new podcasting interview setup space and technology, and that's, you're gonna be seeing stuff from that very soon. But, okay, so what do we mean by thinking in a global context? So I grew up in America. I grew up in New York, uh, spent all my life inside the United States until I was relatively old, and in doing that, I, I visited places, right? But I didn't live abroad. And when you live in the United States, you vary in Canada as well. You're in a contained area. And when you're in that large contained area, it is really normal. It is very necessary to think Think in terms of what can you do in that in that space. If you're talking about healthcare, this is a great example. If you're talking about healthcare, you would never say, "Well, okay, so so I have a heart condition, but you know if things go wrong, I know the United States can't deal with it, so I'm going to hop on a plane and fly to Europe." You would never do that. One, because the United States generally has whatever service you need, and two, getting anywhere else would be astronomically time-consuming and encumbered. Like, it would just be very, very difficult. So you don't see people doing that. That's not how things are done from a practicality standpoint, from affordability standpoint, you name it. Now, of course, there's special cases. You want special plastic surgery, and you're not in an emergency, and you've got time, and you want to go to, you know, Brazil to get it done, no big deal. As long as you have the money to do that, it's not a problem. But for normal things, like just thinking of healthcare as a thing larger than your country is impractical to the, to the point of almost impossible. So you would never do that. Uh, but if you're going to live here in Nicaragua, as an example, but this applies to nearly all countries, including most of Europe, most of Southeast Asia, most of Africa, most of Latin America, and, and definitely in this portion of Latin America in the north, you think very differently. Countries are very small, borders are not a big deal, and we think of ourselves as regional rather than national in most cases. And when you're thinking about something, for example, healthcare, and you say, well, I have a heart issue, of course, in all situations, you know, acute care needs to be taken care of in your local community. You can't think at a national scale. You have to think at an ambulance ride scale. Can an ambulance get me to a facility that's going to do what I need? If so, great. If not, you have a problem. So you think in those terms, that's how you're going to deal with it. So that is, uh, that is a very important aspect of thinking about things like your healthcare. Uh, but when you think about greater things, so well, I have this major heart condition and now I need to have surgery for it. Are you going to worry about what's within an ambulance ride? No, you're gonna go, well, where can I find a specialist? How can I get there? What can I do? And in, and in looking at that, you have a completely different context. Uh, so in the United States, of course, you would say, maybe I'll go to a neighboring city. Maybe I'll even go to a neighboring state. In an extreme circumstance, maybe I'll go to a specialty clinic such as the Cleveland or Mayo clinics, uh, which are famous, that people would actually bother to travel there for special situations. Definitely not for normal care unless you're local. But when you're in a place like Nicaragua, but again, this applies to just all kinds of places, so much of the world, you would very easily 
treat your region in the way that you treat those different areas of the United States. For, for us, yes, acute care, we're going to go to our local hospital. Yes, for slightly more important, we're going to go to whatever is our nearby major hospital. But when it comes to something like, oh, I need to have really, really delicate heart surgery or something being done, well, you would consider going to another country, probably not one across the ocean, but definitely one over a national border without hesitating. It would never really cross your mind once you're used to this context to not do that. The idea that a doctor in Colombia or Mexico or El Salvador uh, it was inaccessible to you or even in some way buried barriered to you would would not really cross your mind because that's not how we think of it. We think of ourselves in a global context and those are resources that we have at our disposal very nearby. They're just part of our ecosystem even if they're not technically inside our country, that doesn't really matter. In the same way that those national barriers are kind of artificial here as far as services are concerned, it would be no different than taking overly into account state borders or municipal boundaries in the United States. I grew up in Rochester, New York. It would never occur to me to say, oh, I can't go to a facility in Buffalo for healthcare. No, if Buffalo had what I needed, I would go there instead of Rochester. You wouldn't think twice about it. So why would you think differently? here in, in Central America for going to a city that's roughly the same distance away. When you start to think in terms of how large different countries are based on their population or geographic area, some of this starts to make sense very quickly. The United States is one of the four largest countries in the world. And Basically, no matter how you look at it, one of the three largest. It's not always clear how, what the order of the top four is, but the United States always comes in in the top three based on any measurement uh, by landmass and by population. It is similar, generally coming in at number three. So when we look at such a large country, you're basically looking at an entire region contained within one country plus Canada, another 10% that is directly next door. And the majority of Canadians live right on the U.S. border. Nearly 90% of Canadians live with a, within a very, very small reach of the American border for weather reasons more than anything else. And so because that region is so nearly compact, but also so far from anyone else, there's no need to look further afield. It is a large enough region to supply anything it could ever need all within that one region. It doesn't ever need to realistically go more global. It could. There's times where there's like a specialty item that you want to get from somewhere else in the world. And of course, that's possible. But the need to do so never really exists. It is a totally self-sufficient region. Other parts of the world, Nicaragua, again, a great example, is not the same. It is a very small country. Both geographically, it is only about the same size as the state of New York, and in population, it is about 7 million people. Well, if you're looking at 7 million people, that makes it the same as the municipal areas of a Houston, Dallas, or Philadelphia, which I mention quite often. If you were to look at one of those cities and say, what if I was to take that city and make it a self-contained island? Well, you'd still have plenty of people. You'd have no problem making a sovereign state out of something so small. Obviously, there are many states that are much smaller. Belize is a great example, under a half million million people as a sovereign nation operating completely on its own. So Nicaragua was many times, 14 to 16 times the size of Belize in population and nearly in landmass, I'm sure, as well. So you have enough people to be functional. But if you were to take a Dallas, where I used to live, and start thinking of it in the context of this is my isolated city, you would very quickly say things like, oh, but if I want to get Amazon delivery, well, my Amazon shipping center is outside the city. If I want to get any number of services that you might name, you start saying, well, that hospital that I want is outside the city. That shopping that I want is outside the city. That food that I want is outside the city. That attraction I want to go to is outside the city. And so you would, you would quickly say, well, if that was, if you're drawing a hard line, putting a wall around one of those cities, people would want to cross that wall on a regular basis for normal things. And when someone would say, okay, I, I need to go to the hospital, I gotta, I gotta get this acute uh, heart care, there isn't a place I need here, people would say, well, just go outside the wall, right? Go to the neighboring city, go to a different place. They wouldn't, they wouldn't think twice about that. But because the United States is so large, you don't have to leave that jurisdiction. And so we, we develop this mental picture of you don't leave your, your tax jurisdiction or your, your legal jurisdiction or however you want to think of it as, as to what the sovereignty of the United States is. But you also wouldn't get on a plane to Hawaii. So it's a little bit more than just the country. It's, it's also the geographic area. But because most countries are so small, like Nicaragua, the size of a city, you have to think regionally 
to be able to function. But because you have to think regionally in order to function, everyone does. And so it changes the way that everything works. So when people say, oh, do you have good health care in Nicaragua? Well, yes, we do. Is it effective? Yes, it's cost effective. They provide good care with all these things. Okay, but, and then people give the but. But what if you, what do you do? Because it's not a big enough place to have a Mayo Clinic, to have a Cleveland Clinic. Since you don't have those things, obviously you have a problem in Nicaragua. In the United States, we have those things. Well, okay, sort of. But I grew up in New York, and we didn't have the Mayo Clinic in New York. We didn't have the Cleveland Clinic in New York. Those were many states away. Well, in the case of Cleveland, two states away. But in the case of the Mayo Clinic, it was eight states away or something. But I still had access to them. But the distance that I would have to travel, the amount of time it would take me to get to one of those clinics, is actually no different than the amount of time it would take me to get to those same clinics from Nicaragua. Now, in the case of going to the United States, traveling from Nicaragua may present some barriers for some people. If you're an American, you have the right to simply return to the United States, and so going to those clinics, you are no farther from them, you're no less attached to them than you were before. So that does not represent, in a functional manner, a greater barrier than what you already had, which is simply distance. So as long as you get over that mental concept that there is a barrier at the, national, uh, at the national level, that traveling to another country for care somehow represents an issue, which and that's a completely artificial thing. It's natural for Americans and Canadians to have that feeling because of the, the this nature of where we grow up. But it is an artificial limit that we put into our own minds, that the services we use must somehow be contained within the nation in which we are currently residing. It is actually, if you really think about it, an, an incredibly bizarre barrier. And you could try this thought experiment to see how it would apply in a different context. Think about the United States. And think about the fact that the individual 50 states, each at one point, in order to legally become a state, and there are exceptions to this, but in general, the, the, to legally become a state, they were supposed to be a sovereign nation that voted to become a state. Now, there's cases where that didn't happen, but they'll definitely the original 13 colonies were all sovereign states that said, we are going to join together. And, and many of the, the states that joined later were also. Well, imagine if we were to simply turn up states' rights a little bit to the point where we're more like the European. European Union or the CA4, and we start having this mental picture where we say, okay, everything should be contained within my state. I shouldn't go to a neighboring state for anything. Well, in California, that might work. In Texas, that might work. But in the rest of the country, the states either don't have the population or the geographic area or both in order for that to be practical. And suddenly, New Yorkers would be saying, oh, the resources I need for certain things don't exist within my state. They're just two miles away, but they're in Connecticut. They're just three miles away. They're in New Jersey. They're just 20, you know, 100 miles away. They're in Ohio. And, and these, these things would, be, would really show is why would I think that the state limit represents a barrier that I can't cross for shopping or food or health care or whatever? It doesn't make sense. But in the same way, a national barrier also doesn't make sense. Yes, you have to have a passport to go over a national barrier. But when you start living outside the United States, generally you're going to have a passport. That's just part of living in the world. And becoming a global citizen is part of the whole aspect of moving out of wherever you've come from. Now, some people move and they, and they just become very dedicated to the place that they go and they, and they really maintain this, I'm, I'm going to give up my passport, I'm going to give up my flexibility, I'm going to be completely in this place, sometimes by necessity, but generally, just, it's just a mental thing. But those who do that, come at, they, they give themselves a, a huge deficit in what they can do, what their options are, what their cost of living is, all those things start to become very poor or much poorer because they're giving up very important flexibilities. And of course, Americans and Canadians who also share this mentality do take some amount of uh, deficit from that. There are negatives that come from having that inclusive, not global thinking mentality, but they're really, really minor in most cases in those countries because they're able to be so isolated. But in, in most of the world, you have to, to be really functional. 
have this more global picture. And it's really noticeable, and you, especially you talk to Europeans, you talk to Latin Americans, and their idea of, oh, I just, I'm gonna cross over into this other country, I'm gonna visit this other country, I've got friends from another country, I date someone from another country, I married someone from another country, I'm gonna have multiple passports. Like these kinds of things are so just part of conversation and society and everyday life. Even people who, in, in the same uh, socioeconomic uh, status in the United States or Canada would never have a passport, would never consider leaving a country, would never even want to see another country in many cases. And you go to a place like Nicaragua, but this, this is true anywhere in Europe, anywhere in Latin America, and those same people are going to be like, well, of course I have a passport. I've always had a passport. Of course I have family that exists in another country. Of course I visit people. Like, it's so rare to not go over the border. It's flipped. What in the United States is, wow, you've been to another country? especially one that's not directly next door, uh, becomes a, what do you mean you've never been to the country next door? Who doesn't go there? Right? Like, what do you do when you want to, you know, whatever thing they're good at? Uh, you, you can't do, you have to go there. Oh, in Nicaragua, like, what do you, how do you go to amusement parks? Our amusement parks are all in Guatemala. Oh, isn't that an, over a national border? Well, actually, kind of not. It's within the CA4 border zone. So this is all within our context. This is within, you don't actually stamp in or out to go there. Nicaraguans are supposed to be able to just go there without any problem at all. Of course, there can be problems, but they're not, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be very simple, very straightforward. And so they're supposed to be able to think of the resources within the CA4 as being like the resources within the United States. It's just state borders uh, for all intents and purposes in between, but still going into Mexico, going into Costa Rica, those are supposed to be really, really easy. And, and they generally are. And being able to get those resources. Now, Nicaraguans have a lot more problems uh, compared to people from nearly anywhere else in the world. So they represent a very specific problem for the people of Nicaragua to be able to do things in a global context in the same way that Americans can. But an American or Canadian living in Nicaragua has the benefit of, of nearly unlimited global context and not leveraging it will do yourself a major disservice. And, and it's in everyday life. It really is. When we think about uh, how we're going to go shopping, if you think in terms of, and you can see it when people ask me questions. This is really why I wanted to cover this topic is because people ask me these questions and so often the answer is, it, it's, and, and I don't know how to articulate it, it's because you're not thinking globally. You're thinking in this, in America I have 2,000 miles in every direction, there's nowhere in America, it's actually that far, and all of this space is America and I can use all of this for whatever task I'm, I'm asking about. But when I'm asking about Nicaragua, I'm putting the limit at just 100 miles in every direction. And yes, I understand that you're in mentally it's because of the national border, for, but from a practical standpoint, you're asking two very different questions. It's apples and oranges. In this massive area of 50 nearly sovereign, very large states, I have this accumulated set of things. But when I'm looking at Latin America, instead of looking at all Latin America as a cultural zone, which would be equivalent to the United States, basically, instead of saying in this cultural zone do I have access to these things, you're asking in this one state within that cultural zone, do I have access to it? So we're asking a lot more of a Nicaragua, we're asking a lot more of a Guatemala than we ask of a New York or a California, which isn't fair. New York and California are richer and much larger by population than those places. So it's a completely different request. We're just, we just expect so much more of places that we tend to move to because the U.S. has it in this way that we can phrase it but it's, it's truly a contrived scenario, not intentionally contrived. People are not saying, oh, I'm going to come up with this wording to trick somebody. No one's putting that effort in. It's not like that. It's a natural thing. We're just so used to having this context of being able to say, well, my country has this, does yours. But when the United States is comparing against a, a very apples-to-apples -apples style comparison, would be saying, here's the resources and things I can do inside the United States. Can I do those things in Europe, inside the Schengen, in the EU? And if you, that, that way you're comparing similar populations, similar geographic areas, similar semi-sovereign states within a conglomeration uh, that acts as a whole, that you have free movement without uh, border controls in between. It's extremely, extremely comparable. But even then, quite often, Americans, when they look at Europe, will say, well, I can do all these things, can Germany do these things? Can France do these things? Can Italy do these things? But if you're an Italian and you live in Turin, 
which is my favorite region, uh, Piemonte, of, of Italy. And you live, one of the reasons that we always said if we're going to live in Italy, we would choose Piemonte if we're going to live there long term. We did live there. We lived in Sicily. That was long term, definitely not where we'd want to go. So isolated. But if you live in Turin and you say, well, I really want to, oh, I just want an authentic baguette. Well, first of all, there's a region of Italy that speaks French and, and might as well be France. So you could go there. And you could also just cross into the Swiss zone that is also French and super close. But if you didn't want to do those things, you could just go the other direction. And within, I don't know, 30 minutes, you're in France speaking Provençal, not French. And you could get a baguette right there, authentic, absolutely, from France and drive back home. And you don't cross a border, you do, but you don't, there's no border control. There's no payment, there's no nothing. It's just, it's just down the street. It's just the next town in that case. All right now it's an extreme example where a major city happens to be close to a border and it's an open border, it's just super easy. So that's extreme, but it's, it's, it's an important example because Americans picture something very different. They picture the movement between countries as something that is at very minimum a strong mental barrier. But for people who live there, it is not at all. And similarly here, if you live in Nicaragua and if you have a car and you can drive places, right, or, or you're just happy to hop in a bus or whatever, when people say, I imagine that when Americans hear, Nicaraguans say, well, I'm just going to run down to Costa Rica for something, right? They think, wow, you got to travel all the way to Costa Rica and then you have to enter a new country and do all this stuff. Well, technically, yes, we do have to do that, but it's really not something you would think about if a friend was going to be in Costa Rica and say, hey, uh, you want to get dinner? Um, okay, I could totally just go hop the local bus, zip over to Costa Rica, don't even need to drive, don't need to do anything, don't need to prepare ahead of time, don't have to think about it. Yeah, I got to get off at the border, swipe in, get back on the bus, and off I go. But I can just hop a bus and go all the way to southern Costa Rica no problem. I can go on to Panama. It's, at some point, it starts taking a bit of time. But all these things are very accessible, and it's very, very easy. And, and I don't have to really think about it in terms of anything other than the distance. How long does it take? Well, it's a really long drive. It's slow road, so it's going to be, you know, so many hours. Well, okay. If that's a number of hours I'm happy doing, great. But there isn't this, like, oh, but that's another country. That's, that's such a different way of viewing it all that... that those other countries are things you just happily move into and out of and, and use so fluidly. And of course, even Nicaraguans and, and Costa Ricans and, you know, we still have a, well, I've never been to Panama. So it's, it feels like a little bit more of a mental barrier if you've never been there. And especially, it's not like the EU, it's not like the Schengen. You do have to have a passport. You do have to go through the border, but it's really easy. People do it all the time. And, and it's just a place you can use. Americans, because crossing a border often it involves so much travel just to get to the border because they're so far away. There's so few of them. There's so few things to do on the other side. It's not like Mexico has all the best stuff of Mexico up against the U.S. border, anything but. And it's not like Canada has a whole bunch of things across most of the U.S. border. There's a few spots, mostly around New York and then Washington State. Beyond those, the stuff along the border is pretty minimal. So you don't actually run up to the border and go, oh, I'm just going to cross into Canada, unless you're at Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, or Quebec, which are all New York. Otherwise, the stuff on the other side in Canada is kind of boring, right? Like, you're just not going to go do that. But if you're in Central America and you're in Esteli and you're like, oh, I'm just going to run across the border into Honduras, suddenly you're in Tegucigalpa, you're in the capital, and there's a lot to do in a major airport. And so we, we think differently, and, and the same goes for Africa, nearly all of it. The same goes for the Middle East. The same goes for Europe. The same goes for Southeast Asia. Uh, it, so many parts of the world. Now, there's a few places that become different because of their size, right? India, China, but even India starts, you start to mix in Bangladesh and Pakistan is always right there in like this weird way. But, you know, India and Pakistan and Bangladesh kind of feel to each other a little bit like the U.S. and Canada do, right? We just have so much in common. We have so much shared history. We're so geographically tied that we, we, we kind of, you know, we overlook them uh, as far as like the mental barrier of being a far off place. And the same thing for Canada, right? The U.S. is just right there. We think of them as being, yeah, it's all kind of different. But we both are like, but Mexico, that's, that's exotic, right? 
And that feeling that these other countries are something that's such a big deal to go to is something that you, you start to lose. So my point in this is that you can change how you view yourself and the world and start to give up this idea that you have to view the country you live in as needing to be a self-contained thing. That's fine that you just love that country and you want to do as much as you can in it and you don't have any interest in traveling any other place. Absolutely cool. And I'm not saying which country that needs to be. It can be any country and that's cool that that is the reaction that you have. But if you want to get that maximum benefit wherever it is, you want to be able to say, oh, but the, to move around my region and to use the greater area is the same as what I was doing in wherever I was from. And by giving myself the shopping, right, does Nicaragua have a, a, an Apple store? No, we don't have one. But can I drive to one faster than you can from wherever you are in the U.S.? You're in Wyoming and like you want to get to an Apple store. Well, guess what? I am many borders away from an Apple store, but there's every chance that I'm in miles closer. Probably not still. It it's probably still goes to the person in Wyoming. But the idea that, you, you know, come up with the thing. Oh, can you get to a Mercedes dealer? I don't know where one is in Nicaragua. Let's just imagine there isn't one in Nicaragua. There probably is, but I, I don't know of one. And someone said, well, I want to have a Mercedes. And I live in, in this part of Wyoming, so I only have to go 500 miles to find a Mercedes dealer. Okay. Nicaragua doesn't have one, but if you're okay going 500 miles, there's probably 10 in the neighboring countries within that zone. And to make a great example of this, one is the healthcare. When it comes to super acute healthcare, something really serious, we are not very far from Colombia. I know it seems like, but that's a different continent, Scott. That's not just a different country. You're talking about a different continent. Yeah, but when you actually look at a map and you start going, oh, so first of all, Nicaragua and Colombia actually share a water border. And if you were on a flight direct there, it's like, I don't know, two hours. Like, we're not talking very far at all. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so if we need acute medical care, that's where we go. It's close and they have excellent care and it's very low cost. So why would we not include that in our scope when we can just hop a plane and be there and get it done? Or for certain things, we would use Cuba. Again, just a couple hours, very simple, direct flight. It's just, it's our local connected place. Yes, it's an island, but that works out great. So for healthcare, we totally think that way. And for shopping, we think this way on a regular basis too. If we need to go, and I just said this to someone, right? Sometimes people have to reset their uh, their passports, their visa, right? Doing a border run. Well, the reality is, and this, this goes with my thinking outside the box episode, right? So someone said, you know, yeah, I could take a couple hour ride to Costa Rica. I could do it on a bus. I could do it in a taxi. I could drive myself. And that's fine. Not a big deal. But have you thought about just how easy it is to fly to Miami, which for those who haven't thought it through, the U.S. also counts for a uh, border run for Nicaragua. And from Managua, Spirit flies direct to Miami. Uh, the flight is only two and a quarter hours. It's super comfortable. It's no big deal. You get points, especially if you have a Spirit credit card. You get a lot of points. And you fly up, spend the night, fly back. But if you're like me, I like to do shopping when I'm in the U.S. So if I was to do that, I would have a buddy in Miami hold some stuff for me and I can send Amazon deliveries to their house and have it all ready so I can fly into Miami. I can go eat at a couple places that I really like. I don't really know places I really like in Miami, but I guarantee there's really good food in Miami that I can't get here. So I can figure out what I'm hankering for, go eat, stay in a hotel for a night, go see my friend, pick up a bunch of stuff, put it in my luggage, and fly back the very next day and just do a border run like that and have it cost almost nothing. We can get flights into the United States for $60 when we really shop around, $110 when we don't on that particular route. Those are really low prices. And you start thinking in that context and you say, well, you know, all this shopping that I want to do, I can't do it in Nicaragua. Oh, Nicaragua doesn't have that shopping opportunity. And it's true. There's a lot of shopping that if that's what, something you want to do, Nicaragua's kind of poor as far as shopping options go. We definitely have stuff. You're not going to be like, I can't go shopping. You can. You can get a lot of things, but especially for me, right, studio lights and cameras and microphones and all these things that I use for the show, it can be difficult to go get in Nicaragua in many cases. And if I can get them here, which is rare, then they're going to be expensive. Often there's a lot of markup on it. Uh, especially because they're very specialty items, right? Normal items aren't marked up that much, but it could happen. 
And so you say, well, I need to do something or I want to go on a trip or whatever. I want to do a bunch of shopping. You take the amount of money you save from the shopping and, and look at the flight compared to it and just think outside the box, run some numbers. Does it make sense? And easily it doesn't, right? Paying for a flight to go shopping is a little bit nutty. But I can tell you it would only take a single camera purchase to more than pay for the flights up and back and the hotel and any meals that I'm going to have there. That's not, that doesn't mean that it didn't make the camera more expensive than it should be, but it means that the cost savings of that pays for it. So if I'm going to get multiple things, like that, whatever cost it took to get up there is divided amongst all those things. Now what we do in the real world most of the time is we don't fly up to go shopping. Instead, we know someone who's flying up and we have them go shopping. And this is perfect. Right now, as I'm doing this video, Alan is in Illinois and I have sent him a whole bunch of stuff. I need a new memory stick. I need a new audio recorder that I'm going to test out with 32-bit float so I can do concerts better for you guys, I hope. It's my first time testing 32-bit float. It's a super cheap Zoom unit, but I think it's going to work. I've got some new, I don't know, cables, a new case for something. My, my phone case is broken. I got a new one because it was a little bit hard to get. And, and so I just have these things. Nothing's very big, right? But they've all been sent to Alan, and he's up there anyway, and he's going to bring them back. And so on some level, that's thinking outside the box, right? I'm taking a different approach to shopping, but we all do that here, so it's not very much outside the box. But it's also taking a global perspective and saying, I don't have to shop in Nicaragua. When I live in Nicaragua, I don't have to shop in Nicaragua. When I live in America, I don't have to shop in America either. It's just that America has the great shopping. So there's no need, there's no reason to be like, well, I want some Nicaragua stuff. But what if I wanted a number, let's say 10, maybe 20, actual alpaca ponchos, beautiful ponchos, look great, feel great, gonna last a lifetime, really, really awesome. Do I go online, do I spend a whole bunch of time trying to order them, spend a whole bunch of money? Or do I just hop a flight to La Paz, fly into Bolivia and go shopping directly on the market and save so much money that it I, I pay a fraction, my, even after my flight, even after my hotels, even after any food I eat on the flight, uh, I eat on the ground when I'm visiting Bolivia, I get enough clothing, I still shove it just in my luggage, we're not talking about a crazy amount of stuff, and fly home. And, and the logic on this makes sense. Those alpaca ponchos could be three, four, five hundred dollars in the United States, could be thirty, forty dollars in Bolivia. What's a flight going to cost to get down there, especially when you add in points and all that stuff, right? Oh, I'm going to spend $800 going down, but I'm going to save, what, three, four thousand dollars if you're getting a luggage full of clothing. Well, that easily justifies paying for it. Sure, you're going to pay more than if you lived in Bolivia and you didn't have to fly down. You could just walk to the store. But that global thinking in America could result in you saving a lot of money as well. I have a Panama hat that I like. It's one of my favorite hats. That hat would have been $100, $150 in the United States. It would have been $40 or $50 here in Nicaragua. It was $3 in Bolivia, as they make them down there. Right? $3. It was, it was one of my favorite hats. That, if I was getting any number of hats, which is not a normal thing to go get, but if I needed 10 hats, it would pay for me to fly to Bolivia just to get them. Now, of course, I could have a friend go shop and send them up. But again, thinking globally changes what's available to you. It changes the dynamic when you start having this, oh, I do have access to the world. And it's not that being an American stops you having access to the world. It simply reduces the value of access to the world for normal activities so much. Of course, travel and cultural experience and things like that, those are equal for everyone. There's no, the United States make, has less value to that. That is not what I'm saying. But when it comes to shopping and healthcare and all these activities of normal life, America doesn't benefit in any meaningful way from having a global context because it's just too big. It, it basically has its own global context to itself, essentially. But for leaving the United States, when you look at evaluating other countries, and, and this may be where it's most important, you're having these conversations and you want to evaluate some other country, and it doesn't have to be Nicaragua, you're evaluating Bolivia, you're evaluating Austria. 
And you say, well, these are things I want to do, I want to buy, I want to have access to. It could be healthcare, it could be uh, shopping, it could be food, it could be whatever, right? And just like in Nicaragua, do we have access to Indian food? Well, no, but in Costa Rica, we have really good Indian food, and this is how long it takes to get there, right? Here's how many hours it is. Is that acceptable for you, right? There's a Taco Bell there. This is how many hours, right? There are places in Nicaragua that are more hours than that away. What if that's where the Taco Bell was? Would the fact that the Taco Bell was inside Nicaragua, but eight hours away, be good, but a Taco Bell that's over the Costa Rican border, but only four hours away, is bad? Well, logically, you can go to, under normal circumstances, the Costa Rican one for half the effort as that Nicaraguan one that's eight hours away. So, if you're trying to think in a practical sense, you have to evaluate it in that way. Which one can I actually use in the real world? Right? Does, does Nicaragua have a, a beautiful Atlantic Caribbean port that I can go use? Well, technically, yes. Is it close? Can you just use it in everyday life? No, it's all the way across the country. I have to get there somehow. Right? Like it's, it's not super useful and everybody wants me to go film it. Like it's a big deal to get all the way out there. I'm going to do it but, and I want to do it. It'll be super exciting, but it's really far away. And so, so I really want, when you're, when you're looking at places, when you're asking questions, instead of saying, does this country have the thing that I want? I think you should be asking yourself, if I live in that country, do I have access to the thing that I want? And quite often the answer will be, well, kind of, right? Okay, I've got to get on a plane, I've got to do this, or I've got to go this many miles. But that's true in the United States too, right? If it, let's use, you really want to eat at a Chipotle, and you say, well, I live in this small town in rural western New York, does it have a Chipotle? No, not in the town. Okay, does the neighboring town have one? Does the neighboring city have one? Does the next city have one? How far out do you have to go before you get to that Chipotle? Okay, this, this number of miles, right? 10 miles, 100 miles, 1,000 miles. Then if you're evaluating Buenos Aires, Argentina, maybe that's where you wanna live. Okay, does it have a Chipotle? How far do you have to go to get to one? Right? And, and do a comparison in a meaningful way. How hard would it be for you to fulfill the thing that you need? And evaluate, of course, is it a thing you actually need or is it a made up thing, right? Oh, I need to get to a Chipotle. And then in real life, you don't actually eat it one. That's not a good thing to do then, right? So be realistic. But when you're evaluating, it's important to, to have this context. And then of course say, in one case, it may actually be a Chipotle. And in the other case, well, okay, so I can't get to a Chipotle and that's called a Chipotle, but I can get to things that are nearly a Chipotle. And I should evaluate them to see if an alternative will meet my needs. There's a Chipotle in Bolivia that is designed to look so much like the American Chipotle, but it's got one letter different in its name, and the food is just the tiniest bit different, but it's basically the same thing. And if you were living in Cochabamba, you have to go out to El Prado and go down the strip and see if that fake Chipotle is close enough. Maybe it's better. Right? Easily it's better, right? It's a foodie city. It probably is better, in fact. But you should evaluate that. You may find that it has a benefit in not having the thing that you thought you wanted because it has something that is different but better, but close enough that it satisfies whatever it is you were looking for. Uh, that was a bit of a complicated discussion today, but it's one that comes up a lot, I think. And, and when we talk about it, it's difficult to articulate that people are just viewing the world in such a rigid way, but not intentionally. It's, it's a rigidity that is just natural. And until you've moved, you won't have any nor normal, natural, automatic way to break out of it. Those of us who have moved abroad and lived all over the world, it becomes a, why don't people just realize that you don't look at national borders? We forget what it's like being inside those borders and this lifetime of not having to look outside. But when you're in that, it really is just natural. You aren't gonna think of it normally, under normal circumstances. It's not going to just occur to you. So it's important to explain this, that when you're starting to look at moving abroad, when you're starting to think in these ways, you need to start changing the contextual framework in which you view what you have access to and what it means to have access to things and what it means to have resources. Because, uh, you know, I, I tell my kids, right, like we have a Denny's at Guatemala City. If they really have a hankering for Denny's, we don't have to do something crazy. We can just go up to Guatemala City. Now, going all the way to Guatemala City just to go to Denny's would be crazy. 
In fact, eating at a Denny's when you live in Latin America with so many great food options is kind of crazy anyway, but you get the point. Sometimes my kids really want to go to Taco Bell. And when we moved here, especially my eldest, she loves Taco Bell, I love Taco Bell, we have this discussion. This is how hard it is to get to Taco Bell. Do we have one? Yes, it's really far away. But you know what, when I grew up in New York, my nearest Taco Bell was like 20 hours away by car. That now we have one that's just four hours, four and a half hours away by car, it's kind of a win. There's a lot of times I've lived closer to one, but a lot of times I've lived farther from one in the United States. So contextually, you know, there's a comparison there to be made. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, if you would share on social media, tell a friend about the show, let a family member know, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And these videos that are on the screen, they're there for a reason. They're there for you to pick one and click on. It is a requirement. Please go ahead and do so now before they disappear.